Right, afternoon everyone. Hope you enjoyed lunch. Thanks for coming back. Um, I'm not going to do a long introduction. Uh, here is Mike Jones. Uh, he, his Twitter profile says that he's a dad of four. Um, during the, his, for his day job, he helps agricultural employers protect their employees, uh, which I think sounds really interesting. But he's going to be talking about using better APIs, building better APIs using GraphQL with Python and React. Here's Mike. Hey, thank you for joining me after lunch. Hopefully it won't be the snooze time. Um, I won't make you stand up though because I'm British and we avoid conflict. Um, <laughs> this title is a bit um, misleading um, because I'm actually not going to talk about React anymore. Um, I was and then I realized that there was, in, there was a lot of uh, content already out there talking about the React part of hooking up your GraphQL endpoints. Um, but there is still, uh, at this point in the life cycle of the Python support for, for GraphQL, there's still not a lot of the Python stuff. So I thought it would be better to fill the time with more details on the Python related stuff. Um, and also, when I, when I put my talk track in, it literally took about five minutes for someone from the Python team to respond back, how much JavaScript is there in this talk? So um, it was a, a, a good idea, I think, to avoid too much JavaScript. Um, yes, I'm Mike Jones. Yes, I'm sick of maps. It's max, maps is spam backwards. I don't hate maps. I love maps. But it always helps to explain that. Um, yeah, and I work at Pixar, not Pixar the movie company, unfortunately, for my children. Um, and uh, we do uh, financial services for farm workers um, who are included in an exemption from minimum wage in South Africa. So if you thought minimum wage was bad, farm workers are paid even less, um, often around 3,000 rand a month. So next time you moan about your salary, don't. Um, so these guys are amazing in what they're actually capable of doing with their finances. Um, often, I have discovered they are saving more than me, which is nuts. Um, although I have four kids, so they're my savings. I'm investing in my future. <laughs> um, but uh, we get to do, uh, a, we essentially are looking at trying to improve their balance sheet. And when I joined uh, as CTO uh, just over a year ago, um, the company uh, was entirely running on spreadsheets. Um, so we were managing several million rand of savings for our clients using a third party system and Google Sheets. And uh, thankfully, we switched over to a, a more CRUD based Django system. Uh, a week before we hit the limit of the number of cells you can have on a Google Sheet, um, which is a million. Um, I think it's arbitrary, um, but uh, yeah, so we've moved, um, and one of the decisions we made um, was to use GraphQL uh, a year ago, so um, I want to talk through that. Um, but first, a caveat um, that says I am not young enough to know everything, so um, forgive me if there's something I've got completely wrong, um, because I generally am focused on getting stuff working and then moving on, um, rather than having the world's most perfect code. And like I don't know what big O notation is, and I don't know what a factory is, and people keep using those words in Python talks, and I don't know what they mean. But I have survived, and I will survive. <laughs> Shall I break into song? <laughs> I've got the <laughs> mic and everything. Um, so. Why GraphQL? Uh, let's start there. What's wrong with REST? Nothing, except some things. Um, some people think it's just JavaScript-induced fanboyism, not invented here. Um, people think, oh, it, they hear it's a Facebook technology, so they think, oh, I'm not Facebook. Um, why is it relevant for me? Um, isn't it just front-end stuff? We don't really we care about that. Um, the, the, the main reason that I often come across um, choosing uh, to move to the, the GraphQL world is, is items like this, where you, you start with a really nice idea of having uh, a REST API and you sit down 
with your perfect architectural head on, define your models, and then and you say, okay, I'm going to have a clean rest endpoint for every object in my system, and you can have all of the nice rest verbs to to make changes to it, and then um, and then you realize that somebody wants to produce a new page on the front end that just has prices. And it's like, why are we returning the entire product catalog with a REST call in order to do that? So somebody says, can we just have, like, can you make me a special endpoint that just has, like, important information on it? And then it's like, can we show the important information but only include the title and the office, not the other one? So you come up with some crazy schema to use, uh, like, uh, using a query string to introduce the column names and then you have to work out how to support that across different versions. Um, and those are the kind of areas that I was hitting up against when I was looking at the design for what we were going to do um, with uh, with what we ended up calling Pixar OS, the operating system that we use to run our company. And um, the interdependence between the different teams, uh, the teams being four of us, um, was even with a team of four that that kind of constant back and forth between shall we build a new endpoint for this or how are we going to pull in that additional information and how do we publish the fact that we've added a new uh, data model um, a lot of those issues when I started exploring the world of GraphQL I realized a lot of those were being dealt with and they were working at scale for people like Facebook so my scale which is much, much lower. Like, I think our machine that we run our, it's a physical server. <sighs> we don't use the cloud. We have one machine, and it runs in a data center in Johannesburg at, I think, about 2% utilization most of the time. So my scale is fine scale. Um, but still, the iteration of the team and the responsibility of the team to build was what we looked at. And, and I think this is a really good example. Um, this is pulled from Brad Frost's site. Um, this is the way a lot of front-end developers and uh, architects think about the way they build systems these days, um, th using the atomic design principles or something similar whereby a, an, a, f a kind of a final view is broken down into atoms which are grouped together into molecules. I think if you can see the, um, you can see they're joining together in groups and then those groups are joining together. And it's kind of this approach that atoms join together to form molecules, just join together to form organisms, and you create templates and you generate pages from them. This approach works uh, works really well from a modular perspective, building out um, a set of components and libraries that you can then reutilize in a consistent way between your different pages or your different sections of a site. This approach and GraphQL work really, really nicely together, and um, you're able to just pull the information that you need. So what is it not? It's not installable. It's not specific to a language, it's not a silver bullet, and it's not a replacement for REST. Um, we, um, th I think these things often come up um, where people are looking for something to install. It's, it's actually a, it's a query language that supports nested resources. Um, it's released originally as a, as a working specification, um, uh, and it's from from Facebook and then they've improved the spec over time um, and it's self-documented and, and typed um, which comes in very useful for when you're basically able to self-generate documentation. So let me stop talking and show you. Um, on the left here is a is a GraphQL query and on the right here is the results. Here's another one. Um, and what you'll notice is it's, uh, it's, it's a query language in the same way that SQL is. Um, and it kind of looks like uh, JSON, except it's not, because it doesn't have commas in it. Um, it has um, line breaks. Um, but what it does is it gives you a shape of your data, which, which when you get a result, that is JSON, and that is in the same shape that you that you asked for. And that's really useful for being able to, um, here you can see this one is a, a query against an endpoint, uh, a node, 
and you're asking for just the first name back, and then I've received that. This one is not specifically linked to an identifier, um, but you can see this one here it has an identifier uh, filter on it, and that returns um, the same, exact same looking object, except because we asked for a user node, it actually returned that in the same description. So it's not confusing in the sense that you ask for me and it gives you a user. You it, what you ask for, you get back, and it ma makes um, makes it very easy for uh, kind of knowing what your sh the shape of your data is going to look like. There's no guessing. Um, here's a much more complicated version, and then a link at the bottom to if you want to understand a bit more about the query language itself. Um, this one's a more detailed one, and this graphical is a tool that is a generic tool that sits uh, that can sit on top of any GraphQL endpoint. Because GraphQL is self-documenting, you can point a, an, a client like uh, graphical at any endpoint and it will know what it can what you can query. So it will block the query from actually being executed, requested against the server if it knows the result is not going to pass, which is very useful if you want to do something. You can think about all the different kinds of things that you could do on the client to save network traffic and save uh, the request response error loops um, because you're able to actually know your query is going to fail before you even make it. Um, this is a much more detailed query. So what you can see here is I've got a, a query I've named stuff, but this time I've got variables that are passed in to my query, and down here those variables are defined. So when you talk to the GraphQL endpoint, you actually send your query, and you can send multiple, you can send a batch of them, and you send your, your variables, and then the server will put those together and, and execute them. So here I've passed in a query uh, with, a, with a variable, and then I'm doing the same again, except this time I'm not asking for a specific user. I'm asking for um, a record set. And I've passed in a filter. Um, this is a specific Python Django execution of the filtering. But what it is, is it's looking for uh, an email address, which and it's running a contains search against my uh, search parameter. So you can see the search parameter is passed into the query, which is then passed into the filter. And then what's, what I've got here is the m information uh, about the result set. I'm also able to say, I could add in here information about the cursor, for example, if I wanted to have the, to know what the cursor start point was. Um, and then this is that node that I had before. When I, if you remember here, I was asking about a specific user. Here, I've got exactly the same uh, field, except it's inside a, a record set. So when it's returned, you get exactly the same uh, shape record set, um, except this, you can see here, is an array. It only returned one, because this record set, for simplicity's sake, only had one person whose uh, email address contained Mike, which is me. Um, uh, but you can see here how the it's, so it, the net has next page is false. So this is a much more detailed query. Um, I just wanted to show you a bit more of the, that it's not just a simple get single result, um, but you can actually use it to make a deep, uh, a deep query. Um, and if you want to learn more about the kind of queries you can run, there's a very good documentation site at graphql.org. Um, the other thing you can do is mutations, which is the equivalent of a, a patch or a, a post query, I guess, with a REST endpoint. Um, and that allows you to mutate data. And in the same way, you're able to nest different objects together. So here, I'm actually doing a, an add user. Um, and I'm passing in uh, the object that I want to create. And I also tell it, once you've done the mutation, I want you to give me the data back. So in this instance, I, I could have also added, it would probably have been clearer actually, if I'd have added the ID here, because what it would have done is added the user and then returned the new user it had created to me. So you can see how this would rapidly improve the amount of calls you need to make um, where you can just return what you need. <coughs> 
So that's a kind of high level view of um, uh, GraphQL from a kind of querying perspective. But from a um, uh, from how this works with Python, that's where I want to spend the most bulk of my time. Um, this is not, however, a Django or a SQL uh, Alchemy or an App Engine tutorial. I'm going to talk about Graphene Django, and you should try and apply these principles. If you use another framework, uh, like App Engine's uh, Big Table, whatever it's called, or SQL Alchemy, there are libraries in the Graphene family, which is the uh, Python implementation of GraphQL. Um, you'll f you'll see those if you go hunt for them. Um, so, but the same principles apply, um, and you can also write your own uh, using the Graphene base library. You can write your own um, implementation that could hook up to whatever crazy ORM you've generated, or if you just want to store stuff in text files and expose it using a GraphQL endpoint, you could do that. Uh, it's totally possible with the toolkit that they give you. And in fact, a lot of the examples that they've built on the site are storing stuff in like JSON files on the file system and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do is just show you um, about the, th the kind of six steps to getting started. Um, install your install Graphene Django, create data models, create a schema for your app, create a, s a mutation for the app, um, create a project schema, um, add a URL entry so you can get to your schema and then configure it and then profit, retire, or write some tests depending on your uh, preferred methodology for living or whether you actually want to use this code in, in two days and remember what you did. Um, so, uh, first go ahead and install Graphene Django. It's on, it's on PyPy. Um, if you're not using PyEnv, I won't talk about that now, but if you're not, then you should, because your life will be much, much easier. Easier, not easier. Um, create a simple data model. Um, so this is a, again, it's not a Django tutorial. This is just a clean, easy Django model. Uh, it's got a, a name and a last name. Um, this is in my appmodels.py. It's a very simple data model. Um, then use the Django object types that Graphene Django provides to actually create a schema that maps to that. And just by default, if you just create uh, a meta class that, ha that references the model, it will automatically expose all your fields on the schema. I'll show you a bit later. You can get specific, um, but by default, the kind of it takes the typical Django approach of like batteries included. It will let you knock yourself out from day one with a few lines if you want to. So that's, that's a node, um, which is similar to that user I requested before. In fact, it's the same. Um, and then, then you create a query, um, which allows you to, um, if you want to be able to show lists of nodes, um, then you define a query. Um, and then you add a a decorator that you specifically resolve, and it's 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 kind of follows the um, uh, the principle. What do you call the principle? The pattern. If you include the resolve and then the word that you expose there, it creates the mapping for you. Um, and you can see here, this is just a standard um, Python uh, a Django return uh, query set, but if if you're if you're used to working with Django, you can probably already start worrying that you can do lots of more, lots of more powerful things than just returning all the objects. So that's what th the application schema would look like. This is a very simple mutation for if I wanted at the moment for simplicity, I've left this to be if you are just editing, uh, sorry, if you're just creating, if you're just creating a new object. So I've in uh, I've avoided editing for now. I'll show that in a minute. Um, it, now I'm creating a mutation in that same file, um, and I'm saying that you're going to be able to input a name and a last name, and those are of type string, um, and that that should be exposed as a node. Um, then again, you've got a, a, a class method. This time, and I'm looking for the input, um, and I could, you, so you could if you wanted not expose your database structure, if you wanted to instead call this 
uh, Frankenstein and Nancy, and then you could map Frankenstein and Nancy to name and last name. There's no, uh, there's, if you want to keep your world sane, you should probably call the things the same, but there's no, there's no direct need to. And then what I've done here is I've just called uh, a, a standard create function um, to actually pass those through, and it will return the mutation. And then you declare your mutation, and again, this is still in the app schema.py. Then, in the project schema.py, so in the same place you declare all your project-specific URLs and settings, etc., you create another schema.py where you expose that root query um, and you pass in those, uh, those other queries. So if you have multiple apps in your Django project, you can essentially expose the schema from all of those by just continuing to extend that list. So in, in our system now, where I think we've got about 20 odd apps inside our Django project, and each one has its own schema, and each one uh, is added to this list. Um, um, and so that's in your project schema. Uh, then, a very base implement, uh, implementation of actually st starting this API to be visible to the world is then you expose uh, on whatever you want. So you could kind of do some security by obscurity and not have GraphQL as your name of your endpoint, um, if that's your thing. Um, and you can pass in this variable. Um, and if you do this, it will actually expose the that graph graphical endpoint uh, sorry, graphical application that I showed before if you query it in the browser. Um, so by default, it ships with uh, a, a kind of toy playing environment. Um, we turn that off, and I'll show you how to do that um, for just for security and for to make your life, make life a little bit harder for people who want to play around with your um, s system. Um, that's in your project URLs. And then lastly, you s declare two very simple settings, and there's a missing curly bracket on the end there. Um, and that just tells Graphene where that schema is. So you could, again, move that wherever you wanted. And at that point, you actually have um, a GraphQL endpoint on your system. So if you only want to do read exposing uh, endpoints with GraphQL to begin with to in order to uh, maybe let your uh, clients or developers explore your API, then you can very quickly create those schemas and ignore the mutation, just create one with a, with a meta class for your model and you've created a, a GraphQL endpoint with full browse capability. So you could do that. However, there's ways to make it better. And this, hopefully, in the next 10 minutes is where the maximum value will come because this stuff was really hard to find over the last year as we dug around trying to put GraphQL in production. And it's paid off really well for us. And we, in the next two weeks, we will open source a project that we've been uh, working on that actually has a whole bunch of these implemented on it. It will be on the GitHub project. It's empty at the moment. Uh, uh, Pixar.com, in words, is the org name, and uh, Maguire is the name of the app. Um, and I'm going to put a whole bunch of these best practices in code up there for you to play with if you want. Um, so these are the things we're going to do just to quickly make it better. One, allow edits. Two, uh, install Django filter and have the filters that you saw in the more complex example. Add some security, add some custom resolvers, and test, because you should test. Okay. So here's a more chunky piece. This is, a, this is just the specific class method from the mutation class that I created before, except now we're supporting editing. So one of the things you'll notice if you, if you go back to that slide in your head where I showed the query results, the ID was a base64 encoded um, uh, string. Um, I don't know why, but somewhere they decided in the GraphQL spec that 
all IDs should be Base64 encoded. And actually, it's not just Base64 encoded ID, it's the node name with a colon and then the ID. So it enables you, to, if you reverse, if you de-encode it, unencode it, unencode it. That's right. Uh, if you unencode it, you can actually tell where that ID came from, which is very useful um, because sometimes you'll see something out of context. But if you can quickly write a bit of um, uh, Base64 decoding, you'll know where exactly where that data came from. Um, so what you see here is we look at the payload again, but this time we set uh, we set up a, a, a dict with those those first two endpoints. Uh, inputs but then if we s we say if id is in the input then we this is a mu this is an edit so go and um decode the uh the id and then try and get that model if it exists then load that and use that and so then go and set all the attributes that you've got uh in your mutation data otherwise just go and if it doesn't have an ID, just go and create it with the data you've got. And this approach allows you to um, to be able to consistently go and, and edit uh, your data. And, and what it allows you to do is, if a mutation only includes a certain fields, you can then, um, you just update those specific fields. And uh, GraphQL is pretty good at giving uh, error messages too. Um, second one. Django filter. Django filters is supported by uh, Graphene Django, and it allows you to instead of doing the direct binding between um, the mutation. I'm um, sorry, the node, the list. Remember before it said um, uh, that users was declared as just a list of user nodes. Now you can actually connect a node and a filter set. So then this is a standard Django. Um, uh, this is a standard Django filters uh, filter set. Um, and so all of the documentation that you'll find out there around Django filter, you can use and learn. And so you can do like fuzzy matching and you can do contains and all those good things. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's a very simple and powerful way to do both filtering and ordering. And then as soon as you reload your schema, when you're typing the in graphical the um, the field name, you'll see the queries for what you can actually filter on. They just pop up in a list and you can type ahead. Um, third, add some security because don't do this without security, otherwise you're a crazy person. Um, so what we do is we, um, maybe I should have showed this the other way around. Like, this is the continued and then I'll go back. Um, we only expose the normal endpoint using uh, a token view. So we have a Django REST to token auth first, and then every time you talk to the GraphQL endpoint, you send the token with it so that you can only access it if you're authed. And so what you see in this one is if the user is authenticated is true, um, and we also use Django role permissions, um, if the the user is authenticated and they have permissions to access this object, then return the node down here or just return a none object. And this allows you to both secure it from an authorization perspective, but also um, to make sure that they have permissions uh, to see the object itself. So they could log on, but they might not be able to see the content. And because GraphQL supports nesting, this could mean somebody could return a list of users they have responsibility to look at, but maybe they can't look at companies because they don't have permission to see those. Um, uh, and then the what we do um, is you can see we've got the GraphQL endpoint and then we've got the graphical endpoint and we wrap that in the staff member required function, which means that they have to have staff permissions in Django admin. Um, and if they have that, then they can use the browsable interface. Um, we just do that to make other people's lives difficult. Um, next, some custom resolvers. Um, here, uh, what we're trying to do is um, that example I showed at the beginning, where if you use me instead of user ID equals certain user, 
um, that that would be a special uh, resolver. And so here, me looks at the authenticated user and tries to get the person that's logged on. And that way, you can return me. Um, that is, um, uh, so you could expand this on top of all of those standard nodes that you do. So this resolve underscore can map to anything. So you could create ones for all kinds of special instances. We create them for things like searching um, and things like that. And lastly, um, testing. Um, it's very easy to set up tests. Um, uh, graphene ships with uh, you the schema, you can actually execute against. If you import the schema from your project, you can actually execute GraphQL queries against it. So you don't just have to use like HTTP-based support for um, doing uh, GraphQL queries. You can actually run them inside your application. So we have, um, we have Celery tasks, for example, that run uh, GraphQL queries natively instead of doing Django object lookups and things like that. Um, so you can use the same code over HTTP or directly inside, um, inside Python. Um, and uh, you can see here, this is just a very simple test. But you can also use the same, if you want to test HTTP, you can use the Django um, test runner to do a post. And then you can test what it would look like if you actually connected to the uh, to the HTTP endpoint, which I recommend you do. And that is a whirlwind tour of graphene. Super, thanks, Mike. Uh, do we have any questions for Mike? Hello. Um, does graphene support GraphQL subscriptions yet? Good question. Um, GraphQL has a, um, has a concept of subscriptions. So you've got queries and mutations and then subscriptions. Subscriptions is conceptually um, a way of saying, um, I'm interested in any changes that happen to this object while they happen. Um, and that um, generally is used for things like a, a long polling view, like if you have a conversation between two people, you can open up, you, instead of you do your initial query and then you create a subscription and say anything that happens to this content, force it down this connection to me. Um, Graphene doesn't support it yet. Um, there, are in, there are pull requests that add support to it um, that haven't been landed yet. I think the author of the library is very busy with his own world and moving to, I think it's version 2, um, and he said he will la um, look at landing that soon. You, there's also examples of people using Django channels, which is the native, well, it's, they decided it's not going to be part of the, the full project, but essentially you can do um, web socket support for long polling, etc. Somebody has written a working version that uses Django channels for sending the messages and uses uh, subscriptions to to it, so it's it's known to work, but at the moment it's not add a subscription endpoint in the same way that you do a schema. But I would expect that to come. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Right. Earlier you said that uh, it is not replacement for REST. Yeah. Right. So if I wanted to make a site and you uh, and that, that uses GraphQL. Uh, as, as many places as possible. Yep. Can you give me uh, examples of where I cannot or, or really shouldn't be using it, or where uh, I should be using REST instead? Yeah, so there's two places that we don't use it. Um, one is for um, uh, triggers, and one is for uh, uh, binary objects. So uh, I have not yet, unless it's somewhere and I haven't seen it, seen anyone that sends uh, like files over a GraphQL mutation. Um, I think that would probably be crazy. Um, so we use, we have uh, file uploading REST endpoints that we use for posting files um, to S3, for example. We have a proxy that does that. Um, the other is triggers, which is um, where it's not so, for me, it's where it's not so logical that something would 
is, is about querying data but causing a series of events to happen. Um, we have a bunch of celery tasks, for example, that um, I wouldn't want. It's not a, it's not a, doesn't link nicely to the query and mutation syntax. So there we have some REST endpoints that you hit it and say, like, send all unsent emails, slash, go or whatever, <laughs> and it returns back a 202 accepted, and then the, the endpoint moves on. So that's, there are two instances where I think REST is still really good. But apart from that, we've, like, we have no other REST endpoints in our system anymore. Um, it's worked very well for us. Any more questions? Cool. I would just, if there's no questions, I would just encourage you to take a look at Graphene, uh, Graphene Group on GitHub. And the, the documentation is not great, but the best thing I've found is if you search in GitHub, uh, across the whole of GitHub, for places where people in their requirements.pip or requirements.txt or whatever have declared that they use Django Graphene and use that as a way of learning. I've actually got a quick question. Okay. Uh, on the client side, what clients are you using to call your uh, API? Okay, so that was where I was going to go to if I actually talked about React. We use Apollo. It's absolutely fantastic. It's really clever. It handles uh, uh, caching and normalization, and we have had like no problems with it. In fact, they're making that library more and more modular and li lighter and lighter over time, it seems to be taking the reverse approach to most JavaScript libraries in the sense it's getting lighter, not heavier over time, and they're taking more and more out of that core. Um, so Apollo is, yeah, I found that to be really good. Um, it uses, um, it did or it's, it still has the same kind of Redux models, which means that you can, um, uh, you can kind of be sure that you're, you can, you can actually play back in using um, browser dev tools, um, you can actually play back how your UI has changed over time with a slider. So you can see what mutation queries were called and how the UI updated and refreshed. Um, so for, for us, that's worked um, really well. Cool, thank you, Mike. Let's give him a round of applause. Okay.